thank you all for being here. We're really excited about uh, today's event. We have two great speakers here with me, uh, Margot Sanger Katz and Megan McArdle. They are two of the most interesting writers on healthcare policy, uh, certainly in town, and they've been doing this for, for quite some time. Uh, let me introduce them first, and then I'll give a few opening remarks, and then they're each going to uh, give some highlights of how the ACA is going from, from their perspective. And then we're going to have a dialogue among the three of us, conversation. And then the last 10 or 15 minutes, uh, we want to hear questions from you and, and what's on your mind. Uh, Margot Sanger Katz is a healthcare correspondent uh, for the New York Times. She, uh, she writes for, um, thank you. She writes for uh, the Upshot. Before joining the Times, she was a reporter at the National Journal and the Concord Monitor, and she's an editor at uh, Legal Affairs and the Yale Alumni Magazine. Uh, Megan McArdle is a columnist for Bloomberg View. She writes on economics, business, healthcare. She writes on just about everything. Uh, she is the author of The Upside of Down, and she previously wrote for Newsweek, The Daily Beast, The Atlantic, and The Economist. Uh, once again, my name is Brian Blaze. I'm a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center. The first research project that I undertook at Mercatus was a study of how the Affordable Care Act is performing relative to initial expectations. So I went back to what was projected about the law in 2010 and compared it to what we know about how the law is performing, particularly on the, uh, with the exchanges. In 2010, four major organizations projected what enrollment would be in 2016. Uh, the Congressional Budget Office, the Office of the Actuary at the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services, uh, the Urban Institute, and the RAND Corporation. And if you take the average of what those four organizations said, they expected about 24 million exchange enrollees in 2016. Three weeks ago, the administration announced there were about 12.7 million signups for this year. And given that there is a net attrition over time in exchange enrollment that we've seen in 2014 and 2015, uh, we probably won't get 12 million people on average this year. So we're, we're really just under half of what um, the expert consensus predicted when the law passed. It's not only that there is lower enrollment, but the risk pools are skewing older and more expensive than what was expected. And that is pretty clear from the large losses that insurance companies have reported. So most of you are aware that the law had uh, startup funding for new health insurance companies called co-ops. 23 of them were started. Uh, 12 of them are no longer in existence. But it's not only these new startup companies that have lost money. Uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Carolina recently reported that they lost $400 million uh, selling uh, ACA compliant plans in 2014 and 2015 and as a result they increased premiums 33 percent from 2015 to 2016. Another thing we're seeing with enrollment is that the enrollees tend to be much poorer than expected. So one data point I have for that is the Urban Institute uh, last January um, when they were coming up with their estimates for King Burwell, they projected that there would be about 25% of enrollees would be above 400% of the poverty line. In the data that HHS released in January, it turns out that there's only about 3% of enrollees above 400% of the poverty line. Uh, most of the enrollees are concentrated below 200% of the poverty line. 200% of the poverty line is about $23,000 for a single person and about $47,000, $48,000 for a family of four. People below 200% of the poverty line qualify for two types of subsidies uh, to purchase uh, Obamacare plans. They qualify for uh, premium tax credits, and they're very generous for people in that income group. And they also qualify for generous cost-sharing subsidies, which reduce uh, deductibles and other out-of-pocket payments that people receive. There's two other um, aspects of um, where people get their coverage. Medicaid expansion. So we've actually seen the Medicaid expansion has had higher enrollment than what was expected in the states that have uh, opted for the expansion. In the, uh, I think, 31 states that have opted for the expansion, they've seen uh, more enrollees and a higher cost uh, from the Medicaid expansion than was anticipated. 
The other big market, obviously most people get their insurance through their employers. Uh, I think this is an area of some surprise that we, uh, most of the experts expected uh, that several million employees would be moved into the uh, subsidized exchanges as a result of uh, the ACA. And we're, there's probably been some decline overall in uh, enrollment in employer-sponsored coverage, but certainly much less than uh, the experts generally agreed would happen when the law passed. Um, finally, i make one uh, point which I think is pretty important. There were uh, three risk adjustment programs put in place by the law. The largest one is, I think the most significant one, is the reinsurance program, which compensates insurers for a large cost of their high, most expensive enrollees. In 2014, reinsurance delivered $8 billion to insurers um, selling um, ACA compliant plans in the individual market. To put that in perspective, that equaled more than 20% of premiums collected in that market. Uh, administration just announced last week that they're delivering another uh, $8 billion to insurers in 2015. Now what's important through the reinsurance program, now what's important I think about the reinsurance program uh, to know is that 2016 is the last year it's supposed to be in effect. So when these sort of back and subsidies that insurers are receiving through reinsurance goes away, I think that is going to put significant upward pressure on premiums and it's something clearly to look at um, uh, when premiums come out later this summer. With that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Margo. Sure. Um, am I close enough to the microphone? So the first thing I always like to say about the Affordable Care Act whenever we talk about it is just what an enormous and ambitious and expansive law it was. So Brian just said like a lot of really important things about what's happening in the new exchanges, these new marketplaces for uh, people who want to buy their own insurance. but you think about what the Affordable Care Act did, that's actually like, you know, one little slice over here. So, you know, a very big goal of the law, obviously, was to try to expand insurance to people who didn't have insurance before. And so the marketplaces are a part of that. The Medicaid expansion is a part of that. And kind of regulations that prevented insurance companies from excluding people on the basis of previous health conditions. Like those, the, the, that part is sort of like the coverage expansion part. But then there are a lot of other parts of the Affordable Care Act that I think we think about and talk about less, but are also really interesting and important. So one is that the Affordable Care Act really um, reformed Medicare in pretty substantial ways. It reduced the amount that Medicare pays hospitals going far into the future. And there's some question about whether those changes will continue to be sustainable. It created a whole center to try to come up with new ideas about how Medicare should pay doctors and hospitals to try to reward them for uh, giving care that's less wasteful and more thoughtful and potentially less expensive. Um, there is a provision in the Affordable Care Act that requires drug companies to disclose the money that they pay to speakers and uh, other you know, outside consultants. There is a rule in the Affordable Care Act that says that workplaces larger than a certain amount have to provide women with a place to um, express breast milk. There is a part of the Affordable Care Act that says that uh, chain restaurants need to provide calorie information as part of their menus. So, you know, I, mean, I can sort of go on and on, but I just, I always feel like we tend to talk about the kind of nitty gritty of this coverage expansion, and that obviously is really, really important, but there's a lot of other stuff in the Affordable Care Act, and it's just, I think it's good to remember that it's there. And the other piece of the Affordable Care Act that I haven't mentioned is that it also created a lot of new and quite substantial taxes to help finance this coverage expansion, and so Congress obviously recently um, postponed the enactment of a few of those, uh, the Cadillac tax, which was designed to uh, tax really expensive health insurance plans, but also taxes on medical devices and health insurance. So some of the financing for the law is uh, not there anymore. Um, the second thing is that because it's such a big law and because it's been such a controversial law from the beginning, it's not, it has not been set in stone. So there have been a number of changes that have happened uh, through administrative choices and through legislation. So the taxes that just were uh, postponed are an example of that. There was a provision of the law that was designed to provide long-term care insurance for people that the Obama administration decided just like wasn't sustainable and it basically uh, was, post was 
stopped and then uh, removed by an act of Congress. There has been funding that's been cut. And so there, you know, there are a lot of, and of course, I'm sorry, the really big change is that the Supreme Court decided in 2011 that the law's provision expanding Medicaid in every state to cover people under a certain income threshold uh, was not constitutional. And so what's resulted is that we kind of have more of a hodgepodge where most states have opted to expand Medicaid, but there are a substantial number that have not. And so, you know, poor people in, you know, especially in the American South, but, you know, in a lot of parts of this country uh, just don't have access to health insurance the way that low-income people do in other states. Um, but anyway, so to the coverage expansion, because uh, I do think that's probably the thing that you guys are most interested in. The Medicaid expansion, I think, has really exceeded the expectations of most of the forecasters in terms of how many people have signed up for Medicaid, especially given that there are many states that did not expand Medicaid. So a lot of people who were newly eligible, who were kind of um, working families, kind of low-income adults without children or who had children who were older, um, those people signed up in the expansion states, but also uh, what I think surprised a lot of people is that people who had always been eligible for Medicaid, so people who had disabilities or who had very low incomes or, um, you know, parents and young kids, a lot of them signed up too. And depending on whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, there are sort of two words for that. So the people who like that call it the welcome that effect, and people who dislike it call it the... Um, I don't know, I forgot. The woodwork effect. The woodwork effect, thank you. So um, Medicaid expansion has resulted in, you know, about 15 million more people having health insurance than did in 2013. So that's a really big change. Um, on the exchanges, Brian just said the latest numbers, 12.7 million people have signed up. Probably not all of them will stay signed up, but we're looking at some people. And that is substantially less than was originally forecast. Um, part of the explanation is that Insure, uh, that employers are keeping people on their work insurance, and that was not expected. There were a lot of, you know, kind of smart and credible forecasters who thought what was going to happen is as soon as there was this new option available, as employers, especially small employers, were going to say, I don't want to bother with health insurance benefits anymore. If I just drop this very expensive benefit that I offer, people will have another place to go. And that just really hasn't happened. It was one of the, when the census put out its health insurance numbers for 2014, it was really, to me, one of the most surprising findings that I've seen since the Affordable Care Act was passed, uh, was enacted, is like there just hasn't been any movement. Employers are continuing to offer insurance to their workers. That may not be true forever, but that's part of the reason why these exchanges have been uh, sort of unattractive uh, for, for people to sign up. But, you know, Brian points out, I think, what is a really smart observation, which is <laughs> I think when the exchanges were designed, they were sort of imagined as being a place that kind of middle class, self-employed people, you know, you're an independent contractor, you're a consultant, you're, you're someone who maybe retired a little bit early, but, you know, and no longer has health insurance through work, that those were going to be the kinds of people who were going to sign up for this kind of insurance. And instead, really, what it's become is uh, an insurance program that's been very attractive to people who are very low on the income scale. Um, you know, the vast majority of signups are people in the states that didn't expand Medicaid who are like, you know, around the poverty line, and then in other states, people who are sort of between one and two, and one time and double the poverty line. And so that's interesting because it means that there remain people who are uninsured who have higher incomes who are not choosing to go into this market. Um, but it's also interesting because it means that if premiums get more expensive, which it seems like probably they're going to, it may not matter as much for the people who are actually in this market. So, um, you know, the federal government provides subsidies that help people buy their insurance plans, and those are based on your income, and then they're based on what the prices are in the market. And so if you're someone who is getting a whole lot of subsidy, you're essentially held harmless if the price of your of insurance goes up from year to year. So there's a lot of evidence that premiums may go up next year, that's probably going to matter more for the federal budget than it's going to matter for the individual people who are in the market. So I, I'm going to stop talking now. I'm happy to talk about the stability of the market and what the insurers, uh, how the insurers are looking at this and, and what their behavior may be in the future. But I think that's probably a good place to stop. Okay. I'm going to, uh, sorry, I hurt my back. So if I appear to be sitting up here like slouching and doing weird things, it's because I have to sit in this incredibly strange position. Uh, however, it has given me a lot of experience with the U.S. healthcare system recently. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, I think the place to start, uh, is because I'm a columnist, I like to do things in like neat threes. So, let's start with what the problems were that people were trying to solve. In fact, there were a lot of problems, and as she has laid out, 
they, they, they then looked for other problems they might just incidentally solve <laughs> while they were at it. Um, but the, I think the three big ones were price, uh, both of individual insurance, like individual healthcare treatments, and of insurance more generally. Um, the second problem was pre-existing conditions. We heard huge amounts about this, about the people who had pre-existing conditions, they wanted to buy health insurance, they had the money, they just couldn't get an insurer to write them a policy. And the third big thing that we heard about was obviously the poor. Although less than you would think, um, most of the uninsured are poor or near poor. The Obama administration tended to kind of maybe not emphasize that so much precisely because they wanted this to be a middle seen as a middle class benefit. That's really important. I don't know if this is actually true, but there was certainly a very strong feeling on the Democratic side of the aisle that a, a program for the poor is a poor program. Um, and you know, you can look at Medicaid. It is the least offers the least generous reimbursements. It's hard to find Medicaid doctors. There was some logic to what they were doing, but they tended to really oversell how this was in the class and really undersell the fact that this was mostly a massive transfer of the poor. Um, but those were the three problems that we kind of attacked. And so how did we attack them? And apologies when I'm reviewing, but for anyone in the audience who was, you know, asleep during 2010, um, it was something called the three-legged stool. And in fact, this stool is like an octopus. It just keeps growing. It's like actually like a starfish. Like it just keeps growing new legs, right? Um, but I think maybe like a five-legged stool is more is more where we've ended up. Those legs are community rating, which is to say that you have to price insurance for everyone the same way. You can't be like, well, Megan's got a fat back and she's got an autoimmune disease and she looks incredibly healthy, so I'm gonna sell or charge Megan nine times more for a policy than, than the healthy person sitting next to me. You can charge us both the same. You can rate it for our smoking history and our age, but that's it. Um, second leg of the stool is something called guaranteed issue. You can't look at me and say, okay, well, I have to price it the same. I don't wanna sell you insurance, Megan, go away. Uh, you have to sell us both policies. The third thing is the individual mandate. This was obviously very controversial. Obama had campaigned on the notion that he wasn't going to have a mandate. That was a lie. Um, I think they, I, I think it's fair to say like he had to know that they were going to have to have one. But it doesn't sound good. People hate it. It's one of the least liked features of this policy. But it's really necessary because you don't have a mandate. You have guaranteed issue and community rating. A lot of states have, but not a lot. New York State and Massachusetts basically had something like that. Um, before Obamacare and before Romneycare. And what happens is, I was uninsured for years in the state of New York because I could not buy a policy for less than four, four or five dollars a month even though I was a healthy 28-year-old non-smoker. Um, it's simply, the, the, what happens is you get what is called <coughs> in, in the trade, the adverse selection death spiral. Uh, as uh, a guy who recently in, interviewed me said, I'm gonna name my next metal man that. Uh, and basically what it means is this, like you start off and you say, well, insurance is going to cost a thousand dollars a month for everyone, and, and but, you know, if I'm a healthy 28-year-old and notice the doctor, I'm like, eh, maybe I'll just risk bankruptcy if I get hit by a truck. And then, unfortunately, you look at the pool next year, and it's more expensive. So you say, okay, now it's 1,200. Well, a few more people drop out, and, and you sort of rinse and repeat until you get to the point that New York and Massachusetts were in, which is why New York and Massachusetts, of all of the states, have had this experience of seeing their insurance prices fall dramatically because insurance prices were so high because they had community rating and guaranteed issue without the mandate, uh, there was enormous room to drop them just by adding that mandate in. That has not been the experience of most states, but in New York and Massachusetts, you really saw a much better deal for consumers once the mandate came in. But to that, we, I think you need to add two stools, and one of them is the subsidies. And the subsidies are important for two reasons. First of all, because as she says, this really uh, reduces the price sensitivity of people to premium increases, but it also means you know, if you tell someone who makes $12,000 a year you have to buy this insurance, and look, it's only $300 a month, they're gonna laugh at you. Um, and a lot of those people are in fact young and relatively healthy, you want them in your pool. Um, and then the last thing is this open enrollment period, and that wasn't really talked about during the passage of the law at all, but it, it, the idea was that basically, look, um, we're gonna say you can only sign up a couple months a year, so you can't be like, ooh, I have cancer, now I'll buy insurance and get treated. How is it going? Um, a few things. At prices, I like you know the Obama administration has tried to claim credit for reducing health care prices, and I don't see it. If you look at it, the, there's a pretty sharp trend line down from about 2006. It then bottoms out and starts to go back up just as Obamacare takes effect. I don't think that it, you can sort of realistically claim that it had a big effect on prices. Um, and that's largely because there was this idea during the debate over health care that there was what I started calling the magic pot of money. Uh, for a while, it was unnecessary back surgery, unnecessary end-of-life care. There was some amount of money, large amount of money, fabulous cost savings to be gained 
by stopping unnecessary treatments that would not anger any key constituency and would not result in anyone not getting treatment they wanted. That was a lie. Um, and I, I, they were lying to themselves. I mean, people genuinely believe this. But you remember when Obama started talking about the unnecessary amputations <coughs> that got saying that we should stop doing unnecessary amputations? That was not something that just for surgeons to enrich themselves. That did not go over well with the, uh, the American Medical Association. He had to walk it back. Um, and it turns out that, in fact, look, first of all, if you look at like the decline in manufacturing, who are our best paid workers now? Where did those people who used to get manufacturing jobs, where are they told to go? Told to go into healthcare, because those are stable, high paying jobs, especially in rural and uh, sort of devastated by the, the recession communities. Are you going to go in and tell LPNs that they're going to make what they make in Holland, which is like half what they make here? No. So part of the problem is that like everyone in the US healthcare system is paid twice what they would get paid in any other country. And that vastly increases the prices that we pay for procedures. We wanted to believe that it was all of these really unnecessary procedures. And it turns out that a lot of it, huge amount of it, is healthcare wages, income to people who will get very, very angry if you take it away. So that magic bottom money never showed up. And so the sources that we had, things like the Cadillac tax, which was supposed to put pressure on prices by basically taxing high value plans. So if you don't, if you, if you have that high first value coverage, it covers everything, any doctor, it's really expensive to provide. Unfortunately, it's also stuff that is much beloved of key democratic interest groups. So a lot of us at the time said, that's never actually gonna happen. And so far our experience has been completely worn out. It did not happen. A lot of the revenue sources have been Healed. They were sort of reluctant to enact the Medicare tax cuts that they, they had. Uh, on the other hand, the uninsured have fallen by roughly a third, right? Uh, unless you're just like in favor of more people being uninsured. I can actually kind of make an economic argument for it. It's not a good political argument, so I'll stop there. Um, you know, uh, or for having more people without like this kind of sort of first dollar coverage, high value insurance. Um, but people love first dollar coverage coverage, uh, and it's very hard to take it away from them. Uh, the exchanges, I think, uh, you know, the Medicaid expansion, has, I won't cover the stuff that people have already covered. So I'm going to talk a bit about the exchanges and where we are, and then I'll just finish up by, um, you know, what we're seeing here is a pool, an insurance pool is a really delicate thing. You want it to be as big as possible, because you want it to be as diverse as possible. Because the law of large numbers basically results in, <coughs> if like, I'm insuring this room, there's a not, in, and, and I charge you the actuarially expected value of, of like a normal American insurance pool, like there's a non-zero chance that two of you could just get some extremely expensive cancer and one of you could have a neonate come in and cost me and bankrupt me, right? But the more people that I get in the pool, the less likely it is because those, those cases are then balanced out. It's the law of large numbers. So you want pools to be as big as possible, you want them to be as diverse as possible, because that may, that is, that's what makes it easiest for you to calculate how much you're gonna spend. Insurers have so far had a really, 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 really hard time calculating what they're gonna spend. They're all losing money. Not all, there are some who are making money. It's really inconsistent, even companies that made money one year, like Anthem, are now saying, eh, we're kind of hoping we'll break even this year, maybe. Um, and that is in part because like, this is kind of like a, a it's like a game, right? I, I mean, it's, it's deadly serious, but it, it, it's like, you know, evolution. The insurers do something, the customers do something, the insurers strike back, the customers come up with a new, with a new strategy. And so what we've seen, for example, as young people, the administration has predicted they need 40% young people. And, that, and by young, you know, I mean children, I mean people between the ages of 18 and 35, which is basically your like, trow healthcare usage. It's when people don't, they don't even go to the doctor, and if they do, they're almost never sick. And they get a baby. Yeah, well, they, 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 then they have babies and, and they get expensive. Uh, but, so, the, those people are the people they really wanted in the pool. They said they needed 40%, because the uninsured skew disproportionately young for the obvious reason that if you don't use a lot of healthcare, insurance is less valuable to you than it is to other people. And you also tend to have less money than you <coughs> earlier in your career. Um, they wanted to get 40% of the exchanges. They basically kind of really seem to be maxed out below 30%. They can't get that. And it doesn't sound that big, right? It's just 10%. It's a huge change. Because it both shrinks your pool and overweights it with your sickest people. And so each year, the insurers are kind of priced thinking, this is going to be this is going to be the year it turns around. And each year, this is not the year it turns around. And because they set the prices in advance, um, that you can probably expect that yet again next year we will see um, 
the, the bigger risk, because the pool is a little bit like, you guys heard about like network effects, because technology companies like Facebook, right, the network is more valuable the more people that are in it. Those kinds of, uh, and, and so the idea is that like Microsoft or Facebook are doing what's called a natural monopoly, because it's so, the network is so valuable that there's basically, everyone's gonna be on Facebook and no competitor can possibly compete with it, because why would you get on Facebook with two people? Uh, so that they can grow. Well, those, those sorts of industries display a bad feature, which is that when they're growing, the industry is very powerful, and when they start to shrink, you get, they, they, they experience explosive growth, they also experience explosive shrinkage. As the network starts to shrink, right, once people start leaving Facebook, it rapidly becomes less valuable, you're not getting new users, and all of a sudden everyone freeze. If you guys remember Friendster, that's what, it, they were doing really well until suddenly they were nowhere. MySpace, same thing. They were huge, and then suddenly they were nowhere. And that's a risk you also have with insurance pools for the same reason, which is that they're more valuable to you when there are a lot more people in them. So as, the, the, the big risk for the exchange that no one's really talking about is if people start, because they're not really very stable right now, prices are going up, if people start leaving them, they are also vulnerable to that kind of explosive shrinkage, which is, as I said, that it, that's what we call the adverse uh, selection death spiral. So why are we worried about that? Few reasons. First of all, these reinsurance plans. Um, Republicans, the administration had envisioned basically making holding, you might say holding insurance companies harmless for the first three years. No matter what they did, they were sort of scheduled to break even. Maybe they'd make a little money, maybe they'd lose a little money, but, but the way these programs were set up, the insurance that the administration had by 2012 planned that the insurance companies would not lose money on these markets as a way to keep them there while they stayed, got established. Uh, in 2014, the Republicans basically stopped that. They deappropriated, the, they basically refused to appropriate funds uh, to allow these those slush funds to operate. And now insurers are losing money. They also underpriced, the co-ops were a disastrous idea. They, they all seem to have had the same idea, which is the old economist joke, we're losing money in every unit, but we'll make it up in volume. Um, they dramatically underpriced, they went bankrupt. Uh, very few of them are going to be left, if any. Um, so that's one, but there, then there are these other weird features, right? So yes, right now the subsidies don't matter. The subsidies are capped. No one seems to talk about this because it's this obscure paragraph, like buried down, it took me forever to find. Uh, basically, the subsidies are capped at 0.504% of GDP. I do not know, know how they got to that precise number. Um, but what happens if the amount of subsidies uh, hits that number is that then they have to they can't they have to start taking subsidies away from some people which means that some people are not only going to be experiencing premium increases but their subsidy declining right now premiums are pegged to your income so if uh, basically if you make four hundred percent of the poverty line it, it essentially functions as like a cap of about ten percent of your income for people who make below four uh, percent of the poverty line it goes that that cap goes up as they as uh, goes down as people get are very poor so like if you're at the poverty line is like 1% of your income. Um, the problem with that is that if we hit the cap, now we're not near that right now because, precisely because the exchanges are under enrolled. If we hit the cap, but with premiums rising so much, there's a danger that we hit the cap and then they have to start withdrawing. It will probably consist of withdrawing it from people at the 400% level and then at 395 and you keep going down. The problem is as those people exit the market, um, but because we don't have a lot of people at the 400% level in the market in the first place, you're really looking at pretty quickly hitting into that 250% of the poverty line group that's where most of the action is, <coughs> those people don't have a lot of disposable income. If they have to start withdrawing subsidies from that group, that's an enormous problem. Now, if there's a Democratic administration uh, in, they will probably look for ways to get around this. There's not a lot of flexibility there. Uh, the, both uh, Congress has not been uh, been happy to help. The Republican have a Republican House until 2020, which means that they're not gonna have room um, to do a lot, and that means that you know if there's a Republican and they're not, they're not going to start increasing the subsidies, partly because it's like you know it's it's real money. It's like 100 billion dollars a year, 5.5 percent of GDP. Um, finding extra money to put on top of that is not going to be a popular Republican cause. So there's a real danger that the subsidies have to be withdrawn. The reinsurance will have ended mostly. Um, and that insurers will start exiting the market, and that what you will then in, be in, in place for is a collapse of the market. Why does that matter? The individual market is the exchange market. It's the same insurance. They cannot change, differ the prices that they charge between the individual and the exchange markets. 
So people keep saying, well, there's often exchange enrollment. It doesn't matter. It's the same policies. If you see this phenomenon on the exchanges, that price problem is going to filter over very rapidly into the rest of the individual market. So this is kind of like the big, is this definitely going to happen? No. There's a lot of steps between here and there, right? I've set up. But that is the major vulnerability, is that the exchanges have not, as I would have expected, stabilized at all. We're still seeing wild price. The, the, the enrollment growth isn't there. Wild price swings. Um, and the pool does not look good in a way that suggests that we're in for bigger price uh, increases in the future. So I would say, you know, look, is Obamacare going away? In, no, they're not gonna, Republicans are not gonna reveal it. Um, could you end up with a, with a phenomenon where we had a Medicaid expansion, but now also we have uh, sort of destroyed the market for individual insurance in, in the United States the way that we had in uh, Massachusetts and New York? Yes. But I mean, the last thing I should say to that is, look, the other thing that's happening this year is that the mandate penalties are getting bigger. We don't know where that's going to shake out. That's the thing, that's kind of the last shoe that I'm currently waiting for to drop, is to, does that mandate penalty finally get those, they're going to be hit for it the first time uh, in next tax season. So does that larger mandate penalty finally get people to walk in the door, young people in 2017 and 2018? I really don't know the answer to that. But I think those are things you have to be watchful for going forward. Can I take one more thing? Of course, yeah. <laughs> so I, the, I just, um, just to zoom out one more time, I think that a lot of the most interesting questions about like whether the Affordable Care Act is accomplishing its goals are going to take a while to answer. So um, I feel like in the first year it was like really exciting because we could see like the uninsurance rate dropped a lot and we saw that you know the premiums were doing what the premiums there were sort of these early indications of like you know things that were changing as a result of the law, but. Like when I think about like how am I going to evaluate the legacy of this law over the long term, so there are like some really big questions that I'm interested in, and I don't feel like we know the answers to them yet. But just to the degree this is helpful to you, this is my framework. So um, one is what does this law mean for people's financial security? So if you just give them health insurance and like their bankruptcy rates are the same, and they still have bill collectors coming after them, and they're still experiencing like extraordinary financial distress when they get sick, then like that insurance hasn't really helped protect them against the financial risk of illness. And I think the early evidence is that especially the Medicaid expansion is making a difference. So for really poor people, if they have insurance that covers most of their health care needs, it means that they, you know, a medical bill is like not going to make them lose their um, home or, you know, uh, have a create a real shock to their family budget. But I think that's something we have to watch over a longer term. The really good evidence about that takes a long time. And the other question is, is this going to really have any kind of effect on public health? So like, are Americans like actually going to be healthier as a result of, ha of the federal government having spent all this money to provide them with insurance and you know, change the regulations around insurance? And that's a question, again, where I think like, we really just don't know the answer now. There are like a couple of indicators that you can look at, like among young adults who got the coverage expansion the earliest. It looks like maybe they're getting like more mental health services. You know, it looks like maybe some preventive services that are now free as a result of the Affordable Care Act. Um, you know, people are using them slightly more. But I think like all of these details about like how we're going to finance health insurance for people, like I don't know if like any of that really matters if people aren't getting healthier and if people aren't getting more financially secure. So that's sort of like my big zoom out perspective that I just wanted to share. So if I, could I like, <laughs> no, I mean, I, I would say like, like I, my sort of questions, open questions, it, when I went into this, you know, how much is this going to uh, change the rate of the uninsured? I think the answer that we now have and with what looks like pretty much a leveling off, I would say, an uptake, I mean, I, this year's enrollment was not exciting by anyone's standards. It was exciting only because the administration had so little ball. They were like, enrollment's going to go down. And when it didn't go down, they got really, you know, look, we exceeded expectations. Um, so, you know, say, is it going to affect public health? I had in 2010 written, I think, the first article that suggested that maybe health insurance doesn't have much impact on mortality, which basically got me sort of pilloried, but is now kind of emerging as you know, because because what I said was so equivocal, which is not it doesn't, but maybe it doesn't. I think actually now emerging is kind of the conventional wisdom because we we did some studies on on Medicaid. There have been some larger studies that came out that are just not showing what we would have expected uh, to see with mortality in Massachusetts. You really have to kind of squint hard and like find weird comparison counties. Um, you know, 
I think the short way to say this is that randomized controlled studies show no effect. Uh, multiple regression studies show a lot. Multiple regression studies are a lot easier to kind of keep mining until you find the effect you're looking for. Um, then there were the things that I was worried about. And I wasn't really worried about whether people were going to get insured. I mean, like, it's sort of trivial that if you give people something cheap, they will take it. Um, it like, so people were saying, look, people have signed up for this. You, the critics, were wrong. Like, I never said no one's going to sign up for insurance. That would have been a really stupid thing to say. My concerns were those. And first of all, the budget. Look, uh, you know, we made these changes to Medicare. But look, Medicare is still in trouble. We took all the savings. We took all basically all of the plausible budget savings that we had in any program, and we spent it all on this new entitlement. We have now done nothing about our old entitlements, which are still there and uh, still have huge problems. Uh, how are we going to fix the budget problems, especially if Obamacare itself develops budget problems? Because the continual delays of all the pay for us, right? Everyone loves the treats, no one loves the bill. Um, and how, how are we going to pay for all of this? If, if Obamacare starts opening holes in the budget, which I think arguably it already has, although uh, relatively small ones, um, the studio has stopped scoring Obamacare, so there's no way to actually tell. Um, then what do, we get, what do we do financially? Um, second was the, the uh, effect on innovation. I think that in general, look, the price incentives in any uh, national healthcare system is for the government to step in and control prices. We haven't done that yet. There's a lot of countervailing political pressures in the United States, but I think that's really there and it's, it's, it's a big concern. Um, especially because it's not like they actually put pressure necessarily efficiently. They put pressure on who has the less, the least politically vocal interest group, which in the United States, unfortunately, is medical device manufacturers and pharmaceutical companies, the two, com the two parts of the healthcare system that are actually innovating. Um, those are the parts that we're most likely to try to take all of the money from. And unfortunately, again, since they are actually not that big a portion of our spending, like the labor, you know, your proton beam machine costs a huge amount of money. If the labor to run it is the larger expense over the long term. Um, you try to take the money out of the proton beam machine, great, now you don't have a proton beam machine, right? Uh, we've still got the labor because those people have it incredibly powerful lobbies, and every time you try to cut their wages, they run these ads. I think my favorite was one in New York showing a woman running through the streets with her baby and ending up in an emergency room that had been padlocked by Governor, I, I think, Pataki. Um, and so, you know, that, that I'm still worried about. It's a long-term worry, though, right? I mean, we're not going to know for 10, 15, 20 years. Um, I don't think we're going to see a big effect on medical bankruptcies. I think we'll see some, but most medical bankruptcies seem to be driven a lot by income loss, which this doesn't really do anything about. Um, I mean, it's there, but the point at which you are, you know, really dying over a, a, a $10,000 medical bill is the point at which you don't have enough income to support yourself, right? That means that you have no savings and you're very close to that already. The big bills are negotiable. Usually, you can, you can negotiate those down to a settlement because they know if you declare bankruptcy, you're not gonna, they're not going to get paid anyway. Um, the inflexibility of the system, right? There's this kind of syllogism in, this is, in, in uh, policy is something must be done, this, this is something, therefore this must be done. Um, we had some option value before Obamacare on how we were going to reform the system. We now don't. This is the system we're locked into. No one on either side has any appetite for changing it. It has a lot of weird. No one, I think, I think it is fair to say that no one, literally no one, who passed Obamacare wanted this system. Like, if you had said, sit down and design a system that is a good system that we should have for our healthcare system, no one would have come up with this. This was this incredibly weird, layered on, it, it's like kludge upon kludge upon kludge. It's like you fixed it with bailing wire, and then you added some spit and bubble gum and like a paper airplane, because you had that, because only you jam and a leak. Um, and at the end of it, right, we made that problem a lot worse. It was bad before. Um, American regulatory policy is terrible. It always has been. Uh, but now it's really bad, and it's totally unfixable. It's really, really hard to pull any piece of this thing apart without the entire thing just completely collapsing. Um, and so it's now really we're locked into this weird architecture. And what does that mean in 20 years as the cracks start to show more? I have no idea. I don't think such a such an optimistic story you're telling. <laughs> I am I I'm, I'm, I'm like the voice of doom. Uh, sorry. Um, let me make uh, two quick points and then ask a ask a question. Megan referenced the Oregon Medicaid experiment, which was a uh, sort of random assignment of people. There was a lottery that Oregon had a couple years ago, and a whole bunch of economists because there really hasn't been 
a randomized healthcare experiment since the RAND, sort of the famous RAND study from the 1970s. And the RAND study sort of assigned people to different levels of insurance generosity and found that if insurance is more comprehensive, people do use more healthcare, but basically found no significant effect on health from I that additional health care. So, so two, two, two things. And, and people had better vision. It's also not clear, well, eyeglasses are kind of trivial, but yeah. it's not really clear, like, you know, there's something called the Texas Sharpshooter Fallacy, where if you draw a bullseye, right, I mean, they tested a lot of stuff, they found one, and so it's not clear whether that was an actual effect or just the one thing that they could name that it actually improved. But, um, but it's also, you can tell a story where hypertension on the poor, it's very treatable, um, and where that would have, have some effect. I've also heard arguments on the RAND study that you know, this was a study that was conducted in the late 70s going into the early 80s, and that sort of secondary prevention has gotten a lot better since then. And so, you know, what the RAND study found is that if you give people less generous health insurance, then they use less health care, and that saved some money, and that they overall seemed, like, about as healthy. And so the question is, is, is the health care that they would forego today if they have, when they're subject to the same financial incentives more valuable than the health care that they, they forewent at that time? And... I mean, that's sort of an open question, but I do think it's an interesting question. I think it is, but I, I think that Oregon found the same thing, and on exactly the stuff that you would have expected, it won C control for diabetes, hypertension, and uh, and cholesterol. Like, those were the, they looked for three targets. The authors, there has been some quibbling about this, but the authors who were very, very good healthy say, we were powered to detect the expected effect. There were enough people in the study to detect the decline that we should have had based on what we know about treatment of these conditions. They did not detect uh, the decline they were expecting in people who had bad hypertension, bad blood sugar levels, bad cholesterol. Um, so like the two RCTs we found, it, it's a problem. It's really hard to do our uh, randomized <coughs> trials on human beings, but they both found the same thing. And that surprised the heck out of me when it happened. Um, I was not the result I was expecting. Um, but you know, the, I, I think it's totally an open question, but I think that both of the, the two randomized control studies that we have have shown the same thing, which is, and it's actually not that surprising. So even people with insurance nine months after who have hypertension, and I have to take hypertension drugs every day, and they make me dizzy, and like, I understand nine months after they're prescribed, the majority of people, like 75% are not taking those drugs. Um, compliance is really terrible, and so, you know, when you're looking at a population that is often has other issues, like their lives are more stressful, et cetera. It's not necessarily surprising that the compliance on these prevention regimes is not high enough to produce the effect that we'd like to see. So, and, and Margot's question is, you know, are, are the, we have to look at the benefits, right? And are the benefits going to justify the cost? And obviously there's a lot of new spending. And if there's great health benefits that come out of this, I think we'd say, well, yeah, we, that, that spending is justified. The same researchers that did the Oregon Medicaid experiment released a paper last June where they estimated the value that the Medicaid enrollees placed on that coverage, and they came up with a pretty robust estimate of 20 to 40 cents on the dollar. Um, let me change gears and ask about something that Megan has written about. Uh, I think last month, Megan, you wrote a paper on how gaming could be the fatal, th um, fatal threat to the ACA, and you talked about the special enrollment periods, and if people are taking advantage of the special enrollment periods to sign up for coverage uh, when they expect to have uh, healthcare services that are gonna be pretty costly and then dropping coverage thereafter. There's also um, a 90-day grace period in the law that allows people to, if they're getting a subsidy, to pay one month's premium and the insurance company can't drop them for, uh, for three months, even if they fail to pay premiums for that entire time. Uh, Megan, if you wanna take one minute and sort of talk about your argument and then Margo, if you could comment. Sorry, I know I talked too long. Um, so basically, uh, what we seem to be seeing, United Health had a conference call. Uh, they had this, it was amazing. Like in October, they had a conference call saying the exchanges are great. We're really excited. In November, they had a conference call saying we're pulling out. This is terrible. We're losing a ton of money. Um, that corporate messaging meeting must have been fascinating. Um, I think, just but aside, like the, the fact that 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 they moved their message so quickly, like I think you can read some things into that also. Yeah. No. Uh, so <laughs> I'm getting that in a second. So what they, they're not the only people though. So a bunch of the insurers are now complaining that what they're seeing is that outside of open enrollment, you can enroll if you have what's called a qualifying life event. You get married, you have a baby, you move states, there's various things, you use a job. 
Um, and the, what they're seeing in, in that in that period is that they're getting extremely high utilization from people who buy insurance, run up a ton of bills, and then drop it. And the people are also using that three month grace period, especially at the end of the year, to basically enjoy the uh, the many benefits of health insurance without paying for those benefits, and then they can just re-enroll next year because there's no way to keep them out of the market. Um, couple things about that. So if this is true, and if it is not halted, that is an existential threat to the exchanges in a way that a lot of things aren't. Um, if that can be done, because the problem is that even people who don't want a game, the, the people who do will drive up the price of insurance to the point where the people who, don't, who would like to virtuously buy insurance for, and, and use it you know, only when they need it, have to feel that they have to game because they just can't afford not to play this terrible game. Uh, that said, a few things we should say. It's first of all, uh, something that I think that uh, uh, Mark may be about to, to get into is all anything an insurance company says is part of a vast strategic negotiation with the administration. And at this point, they're trying to get the administration to give them a bunch of money uh, through the insurance, the reinsurance uh, facilities. So you always have to take everything they say with a grain of salt. That said, these are audited financial statements. They're not allowed to make up lies. The SEC can and will come flat you with gigantic unpleasant fines if you say things that are just flatly untrue their auditor will not sign off they are in fact losing money on these policies that is not in dispute why they are losing money and because there's also other reasons they might be so for example something that's not really gaming but okay I lose my job I didn't have insurance on the job so I can't go Cobra well if I just lost my job am I gonna buy insurance and eh, you know I'll, I'll go down to Walmart and put in some applications see what happens three months later I get a job and I go out okay I lose my job, I'm sick. I'm on the exchange that day making sure I have a health insurance coverage. But there may just be some adverse selection in that open and in, in, in that non-open enrollment period that we're seeing. I don't know. Um, so I don't know how bad gaming is, but if it is as bad as the insurers say, and you should be very cautious before deciding that it is, but even if it's not that bad but happening, I'm surprised. Gaming laws like this usually takes, there's a lag. It takes people a while to figure out the little exploits, things like, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the, to use one that I use myself, totally legal, backdoor IRA, where you can put money into a non-taxable, a non-tax advantaged IRA and immediately roll it over into a Roth IRA, which makes it tax free, okay? That's it, like, everyone does this. I'm not, I'm not casting moral aspersions on people who do it. It takes a while, it took a long time to figure out the backdoor IRA strategy and for it to become widespread. If gaming is this widespread that early, that is a huge problem for the exchanges. The administration, however, is talking about cracking down on, on the documentation, so I don't know. It, it may be fixed. It may not exist. It's all very up in the air. Why do you think the administration, you know, especially early on, and you know, if you guys all remember the first year of uh, the exchanges when the website didn't work and, you know, it's just like sort of bad news and, and uh, doom and gloom all the time, I think that early on there was a real desire to just like get as many people in the door as possible because there was a feeling that politically you just like need to get the enrollment numbers higher so that the prop the whole program is like not doomed deemed a failure um it does seem like now they are starting to like crack down on some of this stuff and they're making it a little harder like last year they created a special enrollment period for people who got hit with the tax penalty where they said okay like when you get your tax bill if you want to sign up for this year we're going to let you sign up late so like they didn't have that this year and they had uh, some special enrollment periods for people who like couldn't provide documentation that they were um, they, they were U.S. citizens or that were they were residing in the U.S. legally as immigrants, and they like got rid of that. So there's some there, I think there is some question about this, but I think ultimately it's really important to remember like this is a brand new market that didn't exist before with like a very complicated regulatory regime that didn't exist before, and like the insurers are like they made some mistakes. I, I think. I think that if the markets get too small or they get too, the risk mix gets too bad or if the administration is like allowing too many people to only come in when they're sick, those are problems. But I think ultimately, once the insurers figure out how these markets work, like they are experts at pricing for these kinds of markets. And it seems like what a lot of them did is they just, they just didn't understand who was going to buy insurance and in what way and they priced too low and that's why they lost money. So it doesn't seem to me like that is necessarily an existential problem. I think they can just solve that problem by like learning from these couple of years of experience and maybe be pricing a little higher next year and that will make insurance more expensive for middle class people who aren't getting these subsidies but for most people who are in this market until we hit that cap it's, it's not really going to hurt their pocketbooks it matters for the federal budget it does matter I think you know sort of in the very long term for the stability of these markets but I think it is reasonable to assume that it's just like going to take a couple of years for everyone to figure out how this works although I'm also not sure entirely that the reason 
some of them, like I think the co-ops were just stupid. Um, I, I think they were inexperienced, but I think a lot of them may have underpriced in, in the theory that they wanted this market to get bigger. Um, and it's kind of a problem that it didn't. It's surprising and problematic that like the insurance wasn't that expensive and basically no one who wasn't getting a subsidy wanted to buy it. So when United made its announcement that they were considering withdrawing from the exchanges next year, it made a lot of news. I'm going to ask a question where you just have to give me a number. Um, what do you think the percent chance is that United withdraws from the exchanges next year? I don't have enough expertise on the details of United's position to answer that question with a number, but I have to say that my kind of cynical reporter view of what United is doing is that they are sending some pretty specific signals to regulators that they want more payments from this risk corridor program, that they want the administration to tighten up some of these special enrollment programs, and also they have competitors who are trying to merge, and I think that they are trying to send a signal that these markets will not will cease to be competitive in the future as a way of trying to influence the way that different federal regulators view those merger talks. And so I think, I think you just have to see this as part of a kind of, you know, they are losing money. I think that, you know, as Megan said, these are real audited financial statements. They are losing money in this market, but. Losing you know, a lot of money in the market. But I think, it's not a small but I think that if they price their product too low and they, and they want to stay in this market, all they have to do is raise their prices next year. There's not, the, the problems that they're experiencing are not ones that are like fundamental to the exchanges or to their business. And I think that what they're really engaged in is like a complex sort of regulatory negotiation with these threats to leave. Uh, I'm going to put it a little higher. Uh, it's an audited financial statement. Uh, you know, these guys float possibilities and stuff all the time. I think they're absolutely trying to signal regulators with everything that they say in public, including their audited financial statements. Uh, at the same time, they're losing a lot of money. I mean, this is not a small amount of money. And I think what you're hearing from them is that, like, first of all, we don't know how to price for this market. And it's costing us a fortune to learn that we don't know how to price for this market. It doesn't, you know, like basically they've gotten almost no information in the first three years because the market won't stabilize. They the market the first year. They're really only lost money in the second year. Right, but they, but they, they haven't gotten information. They wouldn't have even if they'd been in, right? I mean, the Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina was, I believe it, Anthem was definitely making money. I think Blue Cross Blue Shield, it certainly wasn't losing what they lost this year. Is that the market's like people are losing more money, not less, which is not what you want to see if there's a learning experience, right? Um, is that because the market isn't stabilized, the information they got in the first three years appears to be virtually worthless. Um, and, and so, except that like we know the pool's old and sick. Um, and so, I think what they're saying is like, it's costing us money to learn that we don't know how to price this stuff. Uh, and also that like, it, we may not be able to sell in this market at a price that just makes sense. Where we're going to get enough people, because remember there's regulatory overhead for doing this. And that's a fixed cost. So unless you're, unless, and it's true, this is true in each market. So for example, like California has two, and you, there's regulatory overhead for each policy that you set up in each market. Um, and that when you look at that, you may just say, look, this market is too small, it's not worth it. Uh, that said, I do think they're trying to signal it. Regulators, I would put it at about a 35% chance they withdraw. I expect that, uh, but some of that sort of depends on what the administration does and what they're politically able to do. I think the Obama administration is going to have a really hard time coming up with a lot of money for insurers in an election year. Like, Hillary Clinton does not want to go in campaigning as Obama, too, on, like, my, I'm going to be out there shoveling more money into money losing insurance firms, right? Um, and so I, I think that it's going to be politically difficult. Republicans are to act, going to act to block it as much as possible, which means um, that I suspect that there is a real risk, although I think not a majority risk, that they will pull out. And I think um, insurance companies have to be considering there's going to be a new administration, right? And they have to be yeah. basing sort of what are the conditional probabilities you get a new administration. And it's a Republican administration, and they're not giving you any money at all. And if it's a Republican administration, I mean, one of the questions that I have is, are they going to look at just providing additional exemptions from the individual mandate penalty. I could plausibly sort of see a new administration coming in and doing that.